Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we've seen from the spokesman that the president gloats over the capitulation of Congress to continue the encroachment of bureaucrats and agencies into the pockets, businesses, and mostly the liberties of the citizenry by continuing that, that, that whole continuation of the funding that these agencies will have through a bill of a continuing resolution that, that's not even a real budget as constitutionally demanded. Today on Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist got it right. We'll be looking at uh, what some of the warnings were, what those that uh, caused uh, the, the thoughts and the gestation of this nation would consider relative to all of the events that's happened since this election. You know, as we think through uh, a lot of this factual information, I have to tell you that listening to the other host on Liberty Works Radio Network is all about getting back to Founder's intent and trying to communicate truth and reason and to get people to think things through. Uh, I'd like you to really consider looking at the other programs on this network. Join the network. Contribute to it. Support it. Great work that's going on here. Today, I have to admit, I'm going to be all over the map with you. Uh, uh, there's as in everyone else's life, there's a lot that has been going on in mine, uh, both personally, business-wise, and, and just taking in the whole totality of what I expected to happen as a result uh, of the elections. In other words, I didn't expect anything to change. The way this Congress has been and is uh, absolutely goes in the truth of what the Anti-Federalists predicted. Uh, I'm going to try and bring some of that in. I'm not as prepared in a script as I normally am for you. Today, I'm going to wing it and bring in those different areas that uh, I think are relevant uh, from those founding documents. Um, one of the things that I commented last week, and I want to bring back up again this week, is that as it was being argued uh, during those uh, conventions, uh, the whole idea that uh, the Anti-Federalists brought forth and the arguments that they brought forth were, were auspicious when it comes to the perspective upon which this Constitution should have always been interpreted. Now, I was really surprised, and I'll bring out again that in, in a booklet that's called the Anti-Federalist Paper Special Edition, that it's commented in there through the research, uh, this component that I want us to, to pay attention to. That, that, and I'm going to quote here. The most important way to read the pro and anti-federalist papers is as a debate on how the provisions of the Constitution would be interpreted or constructed. Those opposing ratification, or at least raising doubts about it, were not so much arguing against the ratification of some kind of federal constitution as against expansive construction of provisions delegating power to the national government. And the response from pro-ratificationists largely consisted of assurances that the delegation of powers would be constructed strictly and narrowly. Therefore, to win the support of their opponents, the pro-ratificationists essentially had to consent to a doctrine of interpretation that must be considered a part of the Constitution, and that therefore must be the basis for interpretation today. This doctrine can be summed up by saying, quote, if a construction would have been objectionable to the Anti-Federalist, it should be intentionally presumed unconstitutional, end quote, end quote. Now, what we have is that that's not how uh, our government for the last 130 years plus have looked at this whole thing around the interpretation of the Constitution. As a matter of fact, I, I'd like to go back all the way to the point of uh, what uh, 
John Marshall started doing when he started changing the way that the Supreme Court would take and look at the Constitution. He started taking and looking at that and saying, oh, the court had this ultimate decision process, and to the extent that they were also free to somewhat legislate. We know all of the rules and the rhetoric and all of that. So it, for me, I have to go back and raise an early question regarding uh, what that proposed constitution um, is and that very same or similar question to this very day. What is the role of the president? And consider how a person without a moral compass would corrupt the office and become a tyrant uh, that was with that experience that the founders of, of America had, then which caused the American Revolution. So one of the primary questions that the Anti-Federalists argued was, was the role of the president? What, well, how did that all tie together? So even today, when, when I'm going to take and, and this evening go through and asking this simple question uh, around not only the role of the president, but bringing this information, hey, what will you do with the truths that you learn today? You know, you have an opportunity to either hold on to the information and bury it, as so many do in their brains, and stew on it. Uh, to add to frustrations along with what we talked about last week as that American DNA. So then you stand there or you sit there and you vibrate out of the frustrations of, oh my gosh, this is the way it should have been. Now, look, we're not getting there. Nobody's doing anything. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm sorry. What you have to look at then is ask yourself that question. Or, you know, are you going to share this with your family so that they have a deeper sense of our rooted heritage uh, as a history lesson that wasn't gotten in school? Uh, that That's pretty cool. You could do that. that. That's one way of handling everything. Or, let me ask this, or, uh, I don't know, better than that, uh, let, let me do this. Let me ask you this. Now, I'm going to suggest this. I'm going to suggest to you something radical. I'm going to incite you to act in a way that will take your frustrations and give them an outlet to accomplish what you've been stewing about. I'm going to give you permission to act as our founders did in every sense of their capacity to promote liberty. I want you to listen. Listen, because this is going to be so radical in this present time that in this present history. You know what it is? Here it is. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go talk to your neighbor. What better time of year is it to go have a conversation with those people which live on your street and in your neighborhood? Did you know that the secret to the success of our founders was first and foremost built upon the relationships in the community. That's what they did. They knew who their neighbors were, what those needs were, what their concerns were. They knew their children. And yes, they knew their views on God and liberty. They had that relationship. Politics and return of what we have as a nation or should have based on founders intent is all developed around relationship. We've put up garages and they connect to our houses. And when you drive in your driveway, whether it's 80 degrees outside, 110 degrees in the Southwest or three degrees up there in North Dakota, Maine, in the coldest areas of the United States, you pull into that garage, you shut the garage door, you walk into that semi-comfortable area, you open the door into your house, and there you stay. Oh, you might go out to the grocery store, but do you take and you look at your other person there standing in line and at least chit-chat to them about the groceries on their belt? that's getting ready to get scanned, you say, hey, neighbor, how are you? 
Do you ever go outside to shovel it a snow or wash your car? Oh, that's right. You take your cars to a car wash. Do you ever go out to mow your lawn and see your neighbor across the street or next door and wave? Shut off your mower and go over and say something to him? Hi, how are you? My name is... I don't remember that I know you even after living next door to you for the last 20 years. Oh my, what do we know? Oh, backyards used to be connected, but now we put up fences. And not the nice little picket fences or wire fences to keep the dog in. No, what we do is we put up six-foot fences so that you can have your privacy. Well, you know what's happened with privacy? It has taken and disassociated us. And not only that in your neighborhood, but a lot of people, oh, okay, you have fellowship at church or your other community activity. But I'm going to talk about church. How many do you really shake the hand of a person when they give you the greeting time? That's all you do. You make the nicety. But after the service, do you say, you know what, I really appreciate shaking your hand. That was the first time I ever did that. What really is your name? What, what do you go to in a Sunday school class? You know, we have all these mega churches, but are people connecting? No. The secret to our founder's success was built upon the fundamentals of relationship and community. I'll take it all the way back to last week when I was talking about Althusius. Althusius, one of the things that he broke down in the whole political structure in Politica, a f famous book that got buried, is the idea that the core of politics, the core of society, starts with the family. Do you even talk within the context of your family? Are you having those relationships within your family that are building, are the building blocks to building those external relationships then within your society? You know what? I, I, we don't do that. We, we, we rather bicker and fight with our family than understand the context of that being the building blocks of the whole of society. Let's go back to church. What, what do you really do when you spend time there? You know, uh, yeah, it took all hours and hours for our founders to get to church. So guess what? They spent the whole day at church. They interacted with one another. They paid attention to those relationships. And yes, they had that extended conversation about what? They talked about not only what happened in the service, but they had the ideas then and, and they had to share the meal. But on top of sharing a meal, what did they do? They talked about what was happening politically, what was going on in their community, who had various needs, how would those needs be met, how did that extend then into taking it to the next level of who else could help. What was community? How did you build those relationships? That's where it starts, my friends. It starts local. We need to get our feet on the street. You need to take all of that that you're going to learn and have been learning across not only this program, but every other program on Liberty Works Radio Network and all of the other so-called conservative media and go talk to your neighbor. You don't have to talk to them about politics right away. Why don't you go ahead and just meet them and find out who they are? Find out where you have some common ground to communicate on. Find out what their needs are. Find out how you can conduct business of ideas and share those ideas for the safety of your street, the safety of your community, all that you have and want to interact with in your society, starting in your neighborhood. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where Mr. Obama started. He started as a community organizer. And we're going to get into more of what happened t this week as we move into the next segment. I want to thank you for being here on Liberty Works Radio Network 
In the next segment, I'm going to try and bring some of the historical perspective from the Federalist Papers to what's happening in Congress now. Now. I'd like to welcome everyone back to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. Uh, sorry, last time I forgot to reintroduce myself. This is Tom Novolis, your host, and today uh, I'm free-forming it. I didn't bring anything to the table prepared because of all of the various things happening in life, as many of you well know. So with that, uh, I mentioned in the last segment that the secret of our founders' success was the fact they understood who was in their community. They were able to build those relationships in the community, and they fostered every political discussion from that whole point of view of what was valid and useful for the community. You know, that was what was called the public good. And, and in looking at that public good, it was all related to a common denominator within the context of the community. Ladies and gentlemen, all politics is actually local. That was what the Anti-Federalists were warning about. That's what many of the, the theoretical writers talked about, is that it had to start with the nucleus, and then it expanded, and you came together for some very common purposes. But what we've seen, especially over the last 150 years, is that more and more the encroachment of the federal government over the states and local authority, as we're even seeing in the likes of Ferguson, Cleveland, uh, Long Island, uh, and many, many other communities where we're seeing national government encroaching all the way down into local issues is everything that our founding fathers warned about. And I will say the anti-federalist founding fathers warned us about. So when we look at what is happening in Congress, because that's what I said, I wanted to bring us to what, what is going on in Congress, it goes to the very simple issues of not having that connection in true effect all the way into local community and overreaching and allowing themselves to overreach in ways that was never intended by those that uh, the Anti-Federalists really commented on and warned about. So what I'd like to do is take a minute or two, probably more, in bringing to you uh, some thoughts of one of the Anti-Federalists. Uh, it was written in Boston about 1788, early on. Uh, the title or, of the work is Observations on the New Constitution and on the Federal and State Conventions. So this is a summation document. This was an article that was written in, in, uh, to the uh, Boston newspaper there. The interesting aspect of it is who was the author. The pseudonym is Columbian Patriot. And ultimately, as the history went through and looked at who this Columbian Patriot was, they thought it was initially Elbridge Gerry who actually was against the new constitution and was very vocal as to why. But you know what? It turned out to be that great writer of the American Revolution history, Mercy Otis Warren. Yeah, Mercy Otis Warren. A, a, a woman, a great patriot woman. And, and here's what she had to say. She had to say, and I quote from the very opening of, of her analysis, if you will, of this Constitution and what was going on or what has happened inside those conventions. She said, quote, Mankind may assume themselves with the theoretic system of liberty and trace its social and moral effects on sciences, virtue, industry, and every improvement of which the human mind is capable but we can only discern its true value by the practical and wretched effects of slavery. And thus dreadfully will they be realized when the inhabitants of the eastern states are dragging out a miserable existence only on the gleaning of their fields, and the southern, blessed with a softer and more fertile climate, are languishing in hopeless poverty. And when asked 
what has become of the flower of their crop and the rich produce of their farms, they may answer in the hapless style of the man of La Mancha, the steward of my lord has seized and sent it to Madrid. Or, in the more literal language of truth, the exegies of government require that the collectors of the revenue should transmit it to the federal city. End quote. So right there, she was looking at in a summation that this new constitution was going to allow the federal government to encroach in every aspect of industry and life with such elements of various forms of taxation that everybody was going to end up poor. We wouldn't have a distinction as we did of great growth in this nation because the federal government was consuming it all. And now we're looking at Congress doing another $1.1 trillion of insanity to take and we're, you know, fund many of the things that nobody even wants but are pork barrel opportunities for Harry Reid and the casinos there and allowing illegals to stay in this country and participate in a way that our founding fathers, even John Adams and those so-called Federalists, would abhor and stand against? Well, let me take you back a little bit more of what Mercy had to say on this analysis. She quotes, Animated with the firmest zeal for the interest of this country, the peace and union of the American states, and the freedom and happiness of the people who have made the most costly sacrifices in the cause of liberty, who have braved the power of Britain, weathered the con uh, convolutions of war, and waded through the blood of friends and foes to establish their independence and to support the freedom of of the human mind, I cannot silently witness this degradation without calling on them before they are compelled to blush at their own servitude and to turn back their languid eyes on their lost liberties, to consider that the character of nations generally changes at the moment of revolution and when patriotism is discount discountenanced and public virtue becomes the ridicule of the sycophant, that's a servile, self-seeking flatterer, Mr. Obama, sorry about that, Perrin, she continues, when every man of liberty, firmness, and penetration who cannot lick the hand stretched out to oppress is deemed an enemy to the state, my Perrin here, patriots is who she's talking about, then I go on with her quote, then is the gulf of despotism set open and the grades to slavery, though rapid, are scarce perceptible. Then genius drags heavily in its iron chains. Science is neglected and real merit flies to the shades for security from reproach. The mind becomes invenerated, and the national character sinks to a kind of apathy with only energy sufficient to curse the breast that gave it milk. And as an elegant writer observes, quote, to bewail every new birth as an increase of misery under a government where the mind is necessarily debased and talents are seduced to become the pangerist, eulogized, of usurpation and tyranny, end quote. He adds, this writer, quote, that even sedition is not the most indubitable, unquestionable enemy to the public welfare, but that its most dreadful foe is despotism, which always changes the character of nations for the worst, and is productive of nothing but vice, that the tyrant no longer excites to the purest of glory or, vir or virtue. It is not talents, it is baseness and civility that he cherishes. And the weight of arbitrary power destroys the spring of emulation. End quote. 
She continues, if such is the influence of government on the character and manners, and undoubtedly the observation is just, we must, must we not subscribe to the opinion of the celebrated Abbe Mabel that there are disagreeable seasons in the unhappy situation of human affairs when policy requires both the intention and the power of doing mischief to be punished. And when the Senate prescribes the memory of Caesar, they ought to have put Anthony to death and extinguished the hopes of Octavius. Self-defense is a primary law of nature, which no subsequent law of society can abolish. This primeval principle, the immediate gift of the Creator, obliges everyone to remonstrate against the strides of ambition and a wanton lust of domination, and to resist the first approaches of tyranny, which at this day threaten to sweep away the rights for which the brave sons of America have fought with a hero heroism scarcely paralleled even in ancient republics. It may be repeated. They have purchased it with their blood and have gloried in their independence with a dignity of spirit which has made them the admiration of philosophy, the pride of America, and the wonder of Europe. End quote. It, isn't it amazing that everything she's saying we can look to today? We can see Congress actually living out all of these ambitions, the wanton lust of, uh, of domination that is actually in the concept of a president. When, when a president sits there and, and tells people on the media, you know, you need to go out. We need to continue to go and cause a ruckus. We need to continue to protest. He's not bringing harmony. When he says that there are problems that are so large that have been here so long, and forever in this nation, he twists the truths. He's setting strides of his own ambition. And you know what happens? It's exactly what she was talking about here. Despotism and tyranny become that which overshadows every drop of blood that every patriot has ever given in this nation from the time of the revolution to every war that was created even by those special interests in creating the wars. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we are have to overcome. We have to get our feet on the street. We have to go meet our neighbors and find out what is it going to take to bring that virtue back into our American lives? What is it going to take to bring that virtue back into your life? What is it going to take to understand the morality required to bring good governance to bear? Good governance only comes to bear when it starts with self-governance. Self-governance has to come from truth and principles that were laid out at the foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand that for us to continue to bring this nation into a place that we want for our posterity, that our founders wanted for our posterity, we have to understand those foundational truths. We have to understand that the Federalists were in fact the true anti-Federalists, and the anti-Federalists were the true Federalists. They were the ones that were saying strong states' rights, local government needs to rule. And now what we have is the encroachment of the federal government. Hey, what's Agenda 21? People look at that and say, oh, that's, a, that, that, that's some kind of nonsense. No, sustainability is raping this nation. It's taking and causing all the way down to local governance to implement things that are unconceivable from a taxpayer's perspective in what it would take to sustain. It's not sustainable. So we can go into that. But when it comes down to how do we honor what our founding fathers did, we have to consider what truths we're willing to go and knock on our neighbor's door with and talk to them about. 
I want to quickly leave you with this from Mercy. It has been observed with great propriety that the virtues and vices of a people when a revolution happens in their government are the measure of the liberty or slavery they ought to expect. A heroic love for their public good, a profound reverence for the laws, a contempt of riches, and a noble haughtiness of soul are the only foundations of a free government. Welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. This is Tom Navolis, your host. I sure appreciate you joining me again for this third segment this evening. We've been talking about uh, getting your feet on the street uh, when you're not happy about what's going on in this government, what's happening in Congress, what's happening with this president, and uh, taking an understanding for yourselves that the success of the founders was having the relationship with their neighbors. Now, just a little bit of history here. Uh, did you know that Samuel Adams' father was the founder of the idea called a caucus? It's true. What uh, he helped develop at that time was what was called the Caulker's Club. And because Boston was uh, involved in a lot of shipbuilding, a caulker was the person that filled in between the planks to ensure that the boat wouldn't sink because it leaked. So that's the job of a caulker. Along uh, the waterfront, uh, Sam Adams Sr. would gather with uh, other members of the community and look at who would be the best person that they could groom up that had the same values, beliefs, and political perspective as they did. And then they would help train that person and bring to bear then through a caucus that person into the political arena. So they came together and they not only were there to make a decision about who that person might be, but also that purpose was to take and groom them, help train them, help them understand the process and functions of liberty as they knew it from studying history and understanding at that time what was the Constitution of England as well as the covenants or the charters that were given to the people of the colonies. So the, this was a very key organization. Now here on Liberty Works Radio Network, we have a number of different programs and different hosts that talk about what's happening in the political arena today from a very present perspective as well as some historical perspectives. So this program, Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, primarily deals with what happened in history so that you can know why you believe what you believe. We talked about that uh, last week, and that's normally what I really try to bring into the whole essence of the program. As I mentioned in the first two segments, this week has been a real interesting week, and uh, I didn't prepare a as I normally do, so we're kind of freeboarding it today. Oh, I get it. The, the CIA was hammered for freeboarding. Oh, that was waterboarding. Oh, guess what? Um, you know what? I think that there's sometimes that measures are required to garner information that is going to benefit us the best. And there's a lot of different methods to be used. But uh, I think some of those could be used on some of the people in the administration to get them to shut up, tell the truth, and uh, anyway, get it right. So with that, uh, let's get back to something that we were talking about earlier. What is it about? Uh, government? What is it about the political arena that we believe that our founders were, were very possessed in understanding? Well, I want to go back to uh, Mercy and what she was writing in her observations on the Constitution. You know, Mercy was an anti-federalist. She had some real questions and concerns of what was happening around liberty and freedom. Uh, so one of the things that she was saying is, and I quote, 
All writers on government agree, and the feeling of human mind witness the truth of these political axioms, that man is born free and possessed of certain unalienable rights, that government is instituted for the protection, safety, and happiness of the people, and not for the profit, honor, or private interest of any man, family, or class of men that the origin of all power is in the people and that they have incontestable right to check the creatures of their own creation, vested with certain powers to guard the life, liberty, and property of the community. So I'll stop there a moment. That's the real essence of government, is to guard life, liberty, and property. So all of these other things, all of these other uh, administrative uh, bureaucrats that are there today in our modern time that's come about in the last 100 years in particular don't belong there. They're just not needed. That stuff could be handled locally if needed at all. Because what we've seen is it's been corrupted, twisted, and money interests are just destroying all of those purposes of government, of life, liberty, and property. Mercy goes on and says, And if certain selected bodies of men, deputed on these principles, determine contrary to the wishes and expectations of their constituents, the people have an undoubted right to reject their decisions, to call for a revision of their conduct, to depute others in their room, or, if they think proper, to demand further time for deliberation on matters of the greatest moment." It therefore is unwarrantable stretch of authority or influence if any, if any methods are taken to preclude this peaceful and reasonable mode of inquiry and decision. And it is with inexpressible anxiety that many of the best friends of the Union of the States to the peaceable and equal participation of the rights of nature and to the glory and dignity of this country, behold the insidious arts and the strenuous efforts of the partisans of arbitrary power by their vague definitions of the best established truths endeavoring to envelop the mind in darkness, the contaminant of slavery and to lock the strong chains of domestic despotism on a country which, by the most glorious and successful struggle, is but newly emancipated from the scepter of foreign dominion. So I'm going to stop right there with mercy for a moment. Because, you know, as we got into, or we haven't gotten into, all of the Federalist Papers, and there's hundreds of them, So when you look at that comparison of the Federalist Papers versus all of the anti-Federalist Papers, you know, it's almost a a three or four to one uh, number of all of those that wrote and questioned what's going on and trying to determine uh, the constancies of what would happen under the Constitution. I think some of the things that Mercy really brings out here are very pertinent to what's happening in Congress right now. We're seeing that we're partisan arbitrary power is, is established, that there's people endeavoring to recommit us to a type of slavery and definitely uh, the chains of domestic despotism. Now, a lot of folks don't see that because they don't understand what those terms mean. They, they don't have that concept. But many of you that are listening to this program do. And if you don't, we're going to continue to teach you about that. We're going to continue to to give you what the founders were saying and the anti-federalists in particular were saying around despotism and tyranny. And by golly gee, I will tell you today that even those in the, the this Congress that are sitting today are despotic by the way that they're allowing to fund agencies and institutions that will take and impair our life, our liberty, and are destroying our property. So with that, I'll start on the property. The EPA, with all of the new regulations coming out, are impacting all of that, our lives, 
our liberties and our property, the liberties of doing business, our lives on, on the way that they're encroaching and taking our dollars that would be used to sustain other things, and on our property, the EPA with the new water insanity that they're going after will impact our ability to own and maintain our property and use it according to what we see fit. You know, this is this is what's happening. This is what we have with this particular administration. And that is exactly what the Anti-Federalists warned against. You know, I keep going and looking at all these, these different aspects of things uh, in, in Sentinel number one, where he talks about uh, of a, uh, a, a Republican or free government uh, can only exist where the body of the people are virtuous and where the, the property uh, is uh, pretty equal and divided in such government. The people are the sovereigns and their sense of opinion is the criterion of every public measure. You know, this is the whole other thing. What is sovereignty and we're the sovereigns? So when we go and we start talking to our friends and neighbors, getting our feet on the street, we have several different things to look at. One, if you're a precinct committee person, it is your elected duty to be go knocking on the doors of those people in your precinct. And I don't mean just those on your walking list. I mean, go see all of your neighbors and introduce yourself and say, hey, I am, yes, maybe a Republican or no, I am a Democrat, but guess what? I'm your, I'm a PCO in this area, and I'm here as an, your closest elected official to help uh, communicate to you what's going on locally, what's going on in our county, and possibly what's going on in the state and, not, you know, maybe nationally. But let's take care of what's happening local first. We want to bring back that sense of the caucus, of the caucus club. What does it mean to get your feet on the street, meet with your neighbors? And then you're, what you're going to find is people that have interest in learning more of the truths, the ideas, you know, what Mercy was talking about here, the, the human affairs with genius, virtue, and patriotism seem to nod over the vices of time and perhaps never more remarkably than in this present period. So, she doesn't she talks about despotism not prevailing and the only way to do that is to find people of the same sentiment as we are so you walk your neighborhood you got to find that out those that aren't PCOs and are liberty minded you need to have that conversation with your PCO and go look dude or do that if you're not going to go out there and walk your precinct, I'll go do it for you or why don't we go together and walk that precinct and then when you find those other neighbors, get them together. Have a home party. Have a home barbecue, a street barbecue, street party. Whatever it takes, bring the people together. And bring all of them together. Invite all of the neighbors to something like that. If not, start with the small group. You see, we have to labor with zeal if we're going to take and make sure that everyone understands the truths of what it means for liberty, for the maintenance of property and the preservation of life as we believe it should be. Now, we're going to hear and see a lot of folks out there that are have uh, beliefs that are contrary to those that the founders have. And I'll always take you back to the fact that, like Samuel Adams, many of them said unequivocally that this is a Christian nation or should be a Christian nation. And so the fundamental values upon which they established all of the political or polity was based on those various principles in the Decalogue, that meaning the Ten Commandments. Oh my goodness, you have the first five that have that relationship between man and God and the second five between man and man. So we have to understand that we need to bring that morality and virtue back into the public arena. We have to understand that that's what the fundamentals were of our founding fathers. So as we go through this, it is a matter of understanding those truths and then to take and get out there and do something. When you sit home and you start stumping on the floor and throwing things at the TV and you know, yelling, screaming, you're not doing anybody any good. You're going to get a heart attack yourself, but on top of that, 
Nobody can hear you in your four walls. Now, if you opened your windows and your doors and you were in a very close proximity neighborhood and you started yelling and screaming at the TV, then maybe somebody would hear you. But I think it would be better if you went outside, looked across the street, looked at your neighbors, waved, and went over and introduced yourself and started to interact. Next week, we're going to continue talking more about the Anti-Federalists and the Principles of Liberty on Samuel Adams' returns. The Anti-Federalists got it right. Right.